Nuclear experts have spent the past couple of years trying to understand exactly what went wrong at Fukushima Daiichi. The March 2011 earthquake and tsunami triggered meltdowns in three reactors. NHK has been investigating the chain of events during the accidents. We looked at how crews on site used fire engines to inject water to keep one reactor cool and why this plan failed. Workers at Fukushima Daiichi faced a station blackout on March 11, 2011. A loss of all backup power. Reactor 1 was the first unit to melt down. Reactors 3 and 2 followed. During our investigation, we learned that before the meltdown in Reactor 3, a battery continued to power the unit's emergency cooling system. Engineers with plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company tried different ways to pump water into the unit before the battery died. None worked, so they decided to use fire engines. They manipulated valves in the facility's extensive piping system to make the injection process more efficient. They wanted the water to run through a single route. They began injecting water into Reactor 3 shortly after 9 a.m. on March 13th to try to prevent a meltdown. Water has been injected. The fuel rods are now safely covered with water. TEPCO engineers estimate crews injected more than 400 tons of water during the day. They considered it enough to keep the nuclear fuel cool. But Reactor 3 melted down anyway, that same day. What went wrong? Many pipes ran to and from Reactor 3. Engineers injected water into the unit using a route shown in light blue. A condenser spotted just off the route, here, caught our attention. The device converts steam that's used in power generation back into water and sends it out. It usually holds very little water. But TEPCO disclosed later that a large amount of water was inside the condenser. We suspected some of that water was supposed to go into the reactor. NHK World asked experts to help conduct a close examination of Reactor 3 to check for possible leaks. We discovered a pump normally keeps water from getting into the condenser. But the power outage at the plant stopped the device from working. We have just found a leak on the way to the reactor. It was a blind spot. We wanted to find out how much water could enter the condenser instead of the reactor when the pump is off. So we went to the Seat Meteorological Lab in Italy to run a test. The facility is among the best in the world for simulating the high temperature and high pressure conditions inside nuclear reactors. Experts put together equipment to recreate the situation in Reactor 3 and to see where the injected water goes. Okay, we can start the acquisition. Right away, the water rushed toward the condenser. The results of the experiment showed that only 45% of the injected water reached the reactor, and the rest leaked into the condenser. If we need to inject water into the reactor pressure vessel, uh, we need to avoid any leakage in the line. This is a, uh, an important topic and must be duly investigated. The experts estimate a meltdown could have been averted if 75% of the water had reached the reactor. The accident in Fukushima prompted utilities in Japan to deploy fire engines and water injection pumps. 
at nuclear plants across the country. But our simulation shows that this is not enough to prevent a severe accident. There are still many questions about what happened at Fukushima Daiichi. Two years on, the search for answers and lessons continues. Engineers at the Fukushima plant are pinning their hopes on new tools to deal with a growing problem. Water they've used to cool damaged reactors is contaminated and is building up. Crews are preparing to test equipment to get that water clean. The engineers say the new device is better than older models because it can remove dozens more radioactive substances. They have three of these devices. They're only testing one. They say they're taking a cautious approach. Crews plan to use the device for about four months. They haven't said when they'll test the other two or when they'll put any of them into full-scale operation. Plant managers had wanted to start the trial last September. They postponed it because the storage vessel was unsafe. Nuclear regulators gave them the go-ahead last week. Radioactive water at Fukushima Daiichi is accumulating at a rate of 400 tons a day. Managers say the new device is vital for securing safety and protecting the environment from pollution. Residents of a town near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant are now allowed to make daytime visits to their former homes. This comes after officials eased restrictions on visiting some parts of the town on Monday. All 21,000 former residents of Namie are still unable to live within the town limits. More than two years have passed since a massive earthquake and tsunami set off a crisis at the nuclear plant. People who have homes in low radiation zones are now allowed to visit them during daylight hours. More than 80% of the former residents will be able to take advantage of the new rules. Michio Tanaka and his wife now live in another city in Fukushima Prefecture. They spent their Monday visit cleaning their home. I hope the government will speed up its efforts so all of us can live in the town together again. Town officials say they hope to complete decontamination work, restore infrastructure, and make some parts of the town habitable within four years. Google has released panoramic images of a town near the center of the nuclear crisis in Japan. Namie lies within the exclusion zone around Fukushima Daiichi and is abandoned. Google's Street View service now has 360-degree photos of the town. For many people around the world, it's a rare glimpse inside the no-entry zone around the nuclear plant. The images show a shopping mall in the heart of the town littered with collapsed buildings two years after the earthquake and tsunami. Not a single one of the 21,000 residents can be seen. Google managers say recording and publicizing images from the area is their way of contributing to the reconstruction.